But without further ado, I'd like to introduce someone who doesn't need any introduction in Hong Kong, uh, Spencer Fung, the chief executive, the group chief executive of Lee and Fung. He's going to be talking about the impact of IoT on retail transformation. Hand of applause for here, Spencer Fung. Thank you, Bay. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you guys? Having a good day so far? First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Brink and uh, Manav, Bay, and the whole team for organizing this wonderful conference. This is my first time in this space, and I think it's beautiful. I didn't even know this space existed. Uh, but now, uh, you know, I found a, a great uh, venue uh, for future events. Um, first of all, let me just uh, do a quick introduction. My name is Spencer Fong. I'm the group chief executive of uh, Lian Fung. Um, I was raised in Hong Kong, went to school in the U.S., um, and I started working with a uh, big company, PwC. Uh, you will see how this is relevant actually in the panel. I'm setting this up for the panel. Uh, but I started my career in a, one of the largest companies in the world. So PwC has, I don't know, 150,000 people in 100 countries. Then afterwards, I went to one of the smallest companies in the world, and I was an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley in the late 90s. So just like many of you, I started my own company, raised money, wrote a business model, uh, pivoted many, 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 many times every few weeks. Uh, I, can't, I can't even like remember how many times we changed a business model. And obviously, it was too early. Uh, because e-commerce didn't take off, and you know we failed. Uh, after that, I went back to my family company, which is Li and Feng. is 110 years old. I'm the fourth generation, and it's sort of in between the two, right? Very large company, smallest company in the world. That's sort of in between. Uh, Li and Feng is a global uh, supply chain management company, connecting about 8,000 retailers in 100 countries to about 15,000 supplies in 60 countries, and we do everything in between that. So we manage the entire supply chain end to end. Starting from uh, product design, product development, finding a factory, raw material, uh, production management, QC, logistics, um, warehousing, delivering to people's uh, retailers' warehouse stores, and also all the way to consumers. So it's everything in between it, and it's completely global. What we're seeing now uh, in the world, uh, in our space, is that there's a lot of changes and disruptions happening. And these disruptions are actually speeding up. Every few months, it's actually speeding up. Uh, on the retail side, you have the e-commerce guys uh, who's been there uh, for quite a long time, you know, like the Amazons, uh, Alibabas of this world, disrupting traditional retailers like Walmart, Macy's, and so on. And that's been going on for a while. And that's putting a lot of pressure on traditional retailers um, in terms of top line, margin, product innovation, traffic uh, in the, inside the stores, profitability, and so on, uh, and ultimate uh, survival. Um, then you uh, have supply chain, which is also going through lots of changes and disruptions. As a company, we source from about 60 countries. China is number one because it's, it's the biggest, has the biggest capacity. But then you have all uh, sorts of countries in Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, spread across the world. And you know what's happening in that world is that you know there are lots of geopolitical and macroeconomical changes that are affecting where things are being produced. Uh, especially apparel. Apparel is spread across the entire world. There's always something happening and some disruption, whether a riot, uh, some kind of uh, disturbances, uh, currency um, uh, changes, and so on. That completely affects where you buy goods. So one day you might be buying lots of goods from Bangladesh, for example, and the second day the country might be shut and you have to move everything very fast. Um, so you know that, that change is also happening faster and faster, and it's forcing a lot of companies to, to be more agile and change faster. Then uh, on one end, you also have the consumers who are changing uh, very rapidly in terms of their uh, uh, taste and what they like to buy. And of course with the millennials and the Generation Z uh, coming on board, um, and also the uh, developing countries, actually middle class coming up, they have completely different tastes and preferences as before. But if I look at the largest retail market in the US, the consumers there, um, they've been changing the way they spend money. You know, the US economy is not bad. Uh, low unemployment, low oil price, uh, there's some growth, but if you look at the traditional retailers, they're all under stress. Because if you look at a traditional retailer, you know, inside a big box, you know, there'll be you know, half apparel and then half, half what you call general merchandise, hot goods. Uh, but consumers are actually changing what they buy. You know, apparel, for example, is 65% of what we do as a company. 
since the early 1900s, the percentage of spent in apparel has gone from you know maybe the high 80s to 90 percent of people's uh, consumable uh, dollars all the way down. Right, it's now low single digit, uh, and it's still going down as a percentage of total sort of wallet size. Um, so we see a lot of these disruption happening, and the consumers, you know, they they're really looking for products that are more exciting. Right, nobody needs another pair of jeans, uh, and when they do need a pair of jeans, another pair of jeans, they go to you know more value, uh, <coughs> sorry, more value retailers. For example, like Forever Twenty One, Zara, TJ Maxx, uh, and so on. So you know, there's a there's a huge uh, disruption happening all along the value chain from the suppliers to the retailers to the consumers, and because of this disruption, there's actually also a huge opportunity, um, you know, for everybody, especially guys who are sitting like uh, sit, sitting here with new ideas. You know, everybody is searching for that new product, that new idea. What is that killer uh, app, killer product that everybody wants? Um, and a lot of these products are actually in the IoT space, wearable. So you know, you, you know, for a retailer, you know, getting these new product ideas mean more traffic to the stores, more revenue, improved operations, um, and more excitement to the uh, to the consumers when they come in, especially serving the new millennials and the Generation Zs. Uh, for the um, for the uh, um, consumers, it's uh, it's more excitement, of course, um, and also they would like to have products that can actually do something to improve, let's say, their lives, their health their lives, uh, their performance, uh, maybe more uh, social interaction with their friends, gamification of some sort, things that are a little bit more exciting than what they used to see in a traditional retail store. And then you have uh, the people in the supply chain. What, is, what do new products uh, mean to the supply chain? It's basically a new product development uh, process. Um, it's a new, uh, complete new uh, sort of supply chain and how you um, you know, bring products to production, uh, to, uh, sorry, uh, to um, uh, uh, prototyping to production and, and then selling and then servicing and all the way down. You know, there are probably about 10 steps, let's say, in that value chain. What we see now is that a lot of the traditional retailers, they have step number 2 to 10, which is producing a product, um, shipping them to the, to the stores, selling it to the customer, serving, servicing the customer, taking the return goods back and so on, but they don't have the idea generation. A lot of the retailers they don't have the type of people that can generate new and exciting ideas. And when they do, actually a lot of these ideas get killed and squashed in large corporations, especially the retailers. And what we're seeing is that you know, there's a new crop of sort of innovators that is popping up all around the world. And you know, Hong Kong is, is one of them, Silicon Valley, uh, you have New York where fashion is meeting technology, there's a lot of new ideas. And you know, to be honest, because the cost of starting a company now is so low, you basically have entrepreneurs all over the world, you know, being able to start any company, you know, with a few thousand dollars, and can be quite successful in generating that idea. Then you hop onto a platform like a Kickstarter or Indiegogo, you, and you get funded. But then, you know, what happens when after you generate that idea and get funded? That's the step two to step ten that a lot of people actually falter uh, and take missteps. Um, you know, for those of you who are on this Kickstarter platform, you know that there's a high-profile case uh, recently, Zano, the uh, that small little drone, uh, which is probably one of the biggest failures uh, at the, um, uh, you know, in that space. Basically, you know, people don't know how to take an idea and the funds to the next steps. And this is where, you know, this is where, you know, people like Brink uh, and Lian Fung and other players in the ecosystem can help to bring that idea all the way through the supply chain to the consumer, and then taking care of all the steps in between it. And some of these new ideas, you know, it could be as simple as a wireless charging device in a bag. It could be as simple as an LED light putting in a jacket to make it more safe for cyclists. And it goes all the way to, you know, uh, weaving uh, conductive fabric into, the, uh, into a, a, a t-shirt so that you can actually do something with it. So, but I'm sure, you know, I'm not the expert in the IoT area, but I'm sure all of you here know uh, all the pro different types of products that, uh, you know, people can actually, uh, people are coming up with. And a lot of these ideas are, you know, um, products that you see in CES in the Consumer Electronic uh, Show. And you know, I think what we're seeing now is that at CES, it used to be a very sort of thin vertical, where the electronic guys, the nerds, you know, the enthusiasts go to see what the new products are. But now, actually, you have you see a whole, you know, it's becoming more mainstream. Um, my colleague sitting over there, Deborah Weinswick, um, was at CES a couple weeks ago and noticed that a lot more retail CEOs are there now. 
right? Just people who would never visit CES, they're all there. They want to figure out what's new, what's next. You know, Under Armour, for example, is making a huge push into the wearable space, into that whole ecosystem. They bought a couple of companies, MyFitnessPal, data analytic companies, to really try to own that whole space for athletes, right? To, imp in in to improve athletes' performance. This is just one of many examples, and everyone is interested. So this whole space is really becoming mainstream, and this is the trend that we're seeing. Now, apart from consumer uh, IoT, um, I'm not sure how many people are in industrial IoT in this room? Okay, there are a few. Uh, but we're, what we're also seeing, because we see a lot of production and, uh, and supply uh, supplies all around the world, uh, we're, we're seeing that industrial IoT is actually also a huge opportunity. I think McKinsey um, forecasts that about one to three trillion dollars, US dollars, can be saved by using industrial IoT. Companies like uh, GE, they're investing heavily into industrial IoT. There's this, um, what's their platform called? Predix. Uh, you know, they're investing quite heavily on uh, industrial IoT to improve, um, you, know, up, uh, you know, cycle time, uh, optimizing the supply chain, cutting costs down, reducing risk, improving health and safety, and so on and so on in the industrial side. Putting sensors into factories and analyzing the data all along, all along that chain and preventing problems from, hap uh, from happening before they happen, like what they do with the engines engines now, with tons of sensors actually in the engine. Um, so that's also a space to watch. Now all of this um, that I talked about with the new products, fitting into the supply chain, delighting the retailers and the, and the consumer, all of this requires a brand new ecosystem uh, in order to make it work. And you know, again, I think the ecosystem partner is actually all here, so you are all part of the ecosystem. You probably know it better than I do. But from what I understand in the IoT ecosystem, you know, there are many steps and pieces that you need uh, to have in order to make it work. Uh, the first part, of course, is to generate an idea. Right? The idea either is something that you think the consumers want or you know that the consumers actually has a need for. Uh, with the idea, you come with a prototype, you pitch it, you raise funds, you produce it, you sell it, um, you know, uh, you know, you, uh, consumers starts to use it, then there's an app, uh, usually to collect the data, and with the data you have to analyze it. And I think, by the way, I think, uh, my, well, in my own opinion, I think the data analytic part is probably the key out of this ecosystem. But then afterwards you have the privacy issue, data privacy, and most importantly, security issues, right? When millions and billions of devices are connected around this world, you have all these holes where you can penetrate. Uh, so I think this is an issue that, uh, you know, eventually, you know, we have to get to. Um, so I think, you know, these are all the pieces that we see, and the data piece is really what we think is the most important. Um, Lee and Fung, for example, you know, we do about 20 US billion dollars of sourcing. This is FOB, uh, of business. And if you translate that into retail, it's about 100 billion dollars of retail. That, that's how much data we have in our database, in one part of the supply chain. And, you know, what we would love to do is to start partnering with people along the entire value chain so that we can marry our data with upstream and downstream. You know, in the IoT space, it will be the consumers and what they're actually using the products for, how they use it, frequency. You know, what, 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 what is the, uh, the uh, pattern uh, that, that uh, you can see actually in the consumer side? And then linking it all to the supply chain so that when a user, for example, is using his toothpaste, when it's almost out, you can start producing the next one. When somebody has washed their t-shirt 30 times, you know it's about to go bad. And you start actually uh, pumping out new t-shirts and selling them uh, products and then maybe producing them even. So integrating that whole uh, supply chain with data and analyzing it. And this, I think, is one of the biggest opportunities out there. Um, and uh, of course, you know, Brink has a lot of the pieces of that ecosystem. And I think they have a very innovative platform that I have not seen anywhere else in the world. And I'm just glad that, where's Manaf? Where are you? I'm just glad that you guys are in Hong Kong. Uh, because, you know, Brink and Lee and Fung are uh, actually partnering now to see how we can bring some of the ideas all the way through that ecosystem and supply chain all the way to the consumers and delighting them. Um, but I think, you know, the advantage of Brink headquartered in Hong Kong and Lee and Fung headquartered in Hong Kong and the fact that we're so close to the biggest manufacturing base uh, in the world, which is Shenzhen, makes Hong Kong an amazing ecosystem for entrepreneurs to be in. Now, I'm, of course, you would say is biased because I'm from Hong Kong, but let's just take my Hong Kong hat off for a moment. I travel around the world, I've lived around the world. There's no place that is as efficient as Hong Kong. Right? The rule of law, infrastructure, low taxes, uh, talent, uh, you name it. 
uh, funding, legal system, you know, everything here is just works like magic, right? There aren't, there isn't another city where you can have 10, 11 meetings in a day. There's not another city like this. No way, right? So by having th these different partners in the ecosystem in such a small area, I think everybody, all the partners in the ecosystem will be able to iterate their ideas very quickly. And I think, you know, as you guys all know it in the startup world, in this in today's age, uh, you know, having the best idea is not really, some, you know, sometimes not really uh, the best path to take. But being able to iterate many, many times, you know, and exper quick experimentation, I think, is, is key. So, you know, I'm happy that, you know, people like Brain, people like Lee and Fong, and the Shenzhen, uh, you know, all the manufacturers are all based out of here. So we have a perfect ecosystem in Hong Kong to really make this happen. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, anyways, uh, I think, um, you know, Hong Kong is a great place. I hope all of you, uh, you know, uh, can spend more uh, time and, uh, and money and place your headquarters here. I've met a couple of entrepreneurs uh, from overseas who told me that they scanned the world um, to see where they should actually place their company, and they chose Hong Kong. Uh, so that actually gave me, uh, gave me uh, great joy uh, to hear that. Um, so anyways, um, that's my presentation, and if anybody has uh, any good ideas, I would love to hear about it. Uh, thank you very much.